we're going to talk a little bit about how to like scale engineering teams and how he has done it in his track record. So uh, please take a seat. Thank you. And then uh, let's uh, discuss a little bit about that. So maybe you uh, go and share a little bit about your background so that we can like have that conversations sharing about like what uh, what is like what it takes like for to achieve to what you have achieved. Right. So uh, my background is I learned to. Uh, I got on Amiga when I was a kid. Me too. <laughs> well, that's why we're here on stage. Uh, so, I, and, and I learned to, to program C from a, from a computer magazine in Sweden. And that's how I got into computing. And uh, just timing-wise, um, the internet bubble happened in the late 90s. Um, I found a team of really good people to work with, um, built some products, and then latched on to a couple of things and had good timing and had a good sense of picking you know, good team to, to work with. And then it took, took me all over the world. I spent some time in, in Tokyo, lived in Hong Kong, and so now, now my third time living in, in London and um, um, worked with some great people, great companies. Um, I don't think there's any method to the madness, it's just you know, following the, you know, the good people you have to meet. Following the passion we heard a lot of times today. Yeah. So I think that's great. So when we had the, the pre conversation, you like asked what you're like really excited about. That one thing that you're really excited about was the commoditization and accessibility of technology that we have now and services, which is like a great asset for teams from everywhere in the world to start like scaling out. So can you share a little bit and elaborate a little bit of that? Yeah, I mean I've worked now in multiple generations of web technology and I'm pretty excited about it the things I don't have to do anymore. Um, I think the cloud revolution enables uh, a whole set of new companies to start without building data centers. Um, now I'm moving on to AI, machine learning, the sort of on tap offerings from, for example, Watson and Google Cloud means that you don't necessarily need to have a PhD in, in, in AI in the next couple of years to actually take, take advantage of it to build your next business. I'm excited about that. I think that's going to enable a whole set of new businesses to, to you know, uh, use the power of AI, for example. Um, I've, my background is usually I've been the tech guy of non-technical companies, um, which is, um, I think that's, I, I like to work for product-driven companies, not necessarily tech-driven, uh, because I think it's uh, fun to make an impact for a very wide audience. And so you've been the, the executive VP of the Tumblr setting of the, the engineering team there. So yeah. can you share a little bit how that was? Because that was like what I remember when it was acquired. It was a very small team, but a huge user base. So I think that you were setting the, the record at that time for the amount of users per, per engineer, right? So at least at that time. I don't know if it still holds, but yeah. Can you share a little bit about like how it was to set up the engineering team? What were like the... So, yes, so, so I think the founder, David, he was disappointed when the team grew more to more than three people. Um, David never, I don't think he really had a job before starting Tumblr. I think the biggest you know, group he's ever been in was his high school class. And uh, he was a one-man machine, which is one of the wonders of Tumblr, was that he could come up with an idea in the morning, code it himself during the day, launch it at midnight, morning after you could see whether it worked or not and then it creates in a, in a uh, much faster cycle than anyone else. Um, so when I got to Tumblr there was, it was uh, still less than 20 people and was just, had just taken money from Sequoia Capital and uh, you know, there were some issues you know keeping things up and running and uh, so um, we had to grow the, grow the team pretty fast and pretty aggressively at that stage. So what kind of like engineer to user ratio do you have? Well, what do you think is like a good metric? Um, I don't think I don't think that metric holds. I think there is usually it's more based on complexity. Uh, it's pretty easy to do a prototype that gets you eighty percent there. Uh, to get to ninety percent there, you know, some depending on the product, you need a team that's ten times larger. To get to ninety nine percent there, you need a hundred times larger team again. I would say it's easy for anyone to prototype you know, a web spider with a put it in an elastic search and then make a search engine for the internet. That doesn't make you competitive with Google, uh, but you prototype a search engine. So I think sometimes uh, quick prototypes are misleading. Uh, it's not going to necessarily help you achieve 
uh, an excellent product. Um, so I think in, in, in the Tumblr case, for example, it took a lot of engineers just to keep the site up and running at the scale that it was at. How many engineers were you when you, when you sold the company back then? Um, it was still less than 100 engineers. So how, how did you go about like finding the right engineers and like building them into great leaders and like scaling it up to a very short time frame? So what was like your key recipe for finding, interviewing, and integrating the right people in the team? I think having a product people love is a like, good start. Um, that's definitely uh, helped me. Um, I tend to look for engineers who have a, just a solid computer science background. I'm not fanatic about the tools, but pragmatic to use whatever, whatever they need for the, for the moment. Um, in the US, I think you have the luxury of, of looking at, for people who have already done it before. There's a couple of good schools for engineers. You know, have you worked at Facebook? Have you worked at Google? Have you worked at Oracle, Microsoft? I think there's, there's a couple of companies that just breed good engineering culture. And, um, if you're bootstrapping a company and setting up uh, the team from the beginning, it definitely helps having some people with experience on the result. So you've worked in a lot of different locations across your, your career. So what is your thinking on like the importance of locations to build a great engineering team? And especially what's your thought on like centralized versus decentralized engineering team? Um, I, I optimize for my own uh, sanity and having everyone close to me has definitely helped me. Um, I think if, you, if you're building product and you're iterating fast, you need very close connections between engineers and product people and you know, people on the same side. So um, even though I know Slack is becoming pretty popular, I think for a large, for a large distributed team, um, I think it's, it's, it's difficult. I know Romania has a long culture of, of offshore or outsourced development. Um, I think that works at a later stage when you're more mature, but it's, for, for me personally, I like keeping things small and tight. And what's like your thought on location generally, like independent of like centralized versus decentralized? Because if you run like things in like different areas, like UK, US, um, I think um, every place is different. I travel a lot now. Um, I switched to the investing side recently, so I see a lot of different markets. Um, Every market is different. I, I think there's a couple of markets that I have an interesting mix of. Um, Silicon Valley grew up on defense contracting and uh, like academic uh, horsepower. There's a couple of regions that have that mix. I think it's an interesting mix of um, very aspirational, intellectual, solving difficult problems, but also the ability to execute and deliver on time. I think. Um, Malmö in Sweden has that, Tel Aviv has that, um, Silicon Valley definitely has that. Um, other areas are more sort of business connected, they're more finance hubs, London, New York. And um, I think there's just plus strengths in every area. What's your advice for the like first time founder who's like the, the technical guy, this, the technical co-founder of this company? What would be your advice for that person to look into like in order to create a great company that scales and uh, hopefully it becomes one of those uh, big successful enterprises. Um, I would say it sounds maybe strange, but build as little technology as possible would be one thing. Um, use the tools available as much as you can. Focus your um, focus your uh, uh, you know intellectual capacity on the things that really matter. For the first six months, for most like product driven companies, most likely going to be nothing. You're going to do pretty boring stuff. You're setting a foundation and creating like your technical debt for the next 10 years. So if you choose platforms that sound fun to attract engineers, you're going to dig a hole for yourself in terms of picking immature technologies that you're going to have to iron out all the early, early bugs. In. So I would say pick, pick it. I, you know, I like boring technology. I like boring technology that just works. And um, then uh, hire the best engineers you can. Um, if in my experience, the engineers who have experience working on large-scale problems at big companies, they understand the value of things that just work. And I think that if you create a culture of that, yeah, you're going to have a better experience. So what's your favorite question? You because you said like hiring the best engineers that you can afford. 
So how do you find out? I mean, what's the key questions that you ask to figure out if somebody is like one of the engineers that you would like to have in your team or not? Um, we ask all sorts of questions. We have had we have pretty elaborate interview processes. Um, I like pretty open-ended questions. I don't like the sort of trick questions. Uh, one question we used to ask at my last company was, um, "How would you design and build Twitter?" It's an extremely open question. You can basically answer it in a number of ways. If you're a network engineer, you're going to start with the hardware uh, layer. If you're a front-end engineer, you're going to you know, pick up a front-end framework and it, you can dig extremely deep into a number of areas and it shows what's your, what's, your, what's your view on architecture, what's your view on what matters the most. Uh, are, you, are you, you know, optimizing prematurely or are you going to take time to market interesting? Uh, I think questions like that, I mean, it's, it's valuable to figure out what type of engineer you're talking to. So one thing that you mentioned a little bit earlier is that you're very interested in like being the tech guy and not a purely tech team, right? So that seems to be like your success recipe that you're saying, okay, you work like not in a pure tech startup because you don't not interested in the tech per se, but you're interested in creating something great. So how do you make sure that the collaboration between the tech engineering team and the product and the UX team works smooth? I mean, what's your, your recipe to ensure that? Um, I think... In, in most organizations, you benefit, benefit from having a feature-aligned uh, feature organization. So as you scale, don't, don't organize by, by platforms. Don't create the MongoDB team and the Cassandra team. Create you know, by feature, align that very well with the product side. So have a one-to-one -one mapping between the product and the engineering teams. Um, create small teams, make them accountable for a feature and not a, a technical solution. There's so how do you align that between engineering and product team, right? So like you can like create those small teams in engineering, but if they don't work very well with the product or the UX team, then you're still screwed, right? So how do you align those teams that are reporting to different organizations, different people? Um, I, so it's, it's usually the problems arise when there's not a one-to-one -one mapping. For example, like, let's say you have divided your engineering team into front end and back end, and then you have a product person who's responsible for, for the feature. It, that, that means you know, a lot of the coordination ends up on the product side. If the product person is not highly technical, um, they're going to have a challenge just, you know, just aligning you know, who's prioritizing what task. So having one person on the tech side, one person on the product side, always be that aligned. That's, that's, my, that's my recipe. So you um, switched to the, to the venture side and are now a partner at the Lakestar. So what is like the things that you're looking for there? So are you like still like looking into teams with deep technology or more product work? What is like the kind of investments that first excite you that you're going into? So, uh, so I, like, I like teams that solve them. Yeah. First, they should try to solve a big problem. That's number one. Um, I th think the solution should be highly technical. Um, that's on the company side. On the founding side, I want the, the founding team to have deep domain expertise, or at least a deep interest in the domain, um, and also technical know-how to figure out how to solve it. I think that, that combination in any vertical is very powerful. When you go in there, how much do you help the teams to like build up their skills? Because obviously the young founders, you've done it a few more times than, than they did. So how deep do you go in and like, help your teams that you invest in? It's usually not so much on like deeply technical problems. It's more about benchmarking, organization, processes, you know, how to align titles as you grow. Um, common problems is, for example, being very generous with titles early on in a team's existence. You know, if, you, if you have a team of 10, 15 people, it probably shouldn't be too many VPs and directors in that team. Um, I think some, some, that's usually been a very good very, very good strategy for, for companies to build um, good, good engineering culture is to be very, very restrictive about handing out lofty titles. So just giving a benchmark, you know, explaining like, well, how different organizations do it, what are good ways to, to you know, think about scaling and growth. What was, the, what was the biggest mistake that you've either like, done yourself as scaling a team or that you've seen in one of the companies that you've worked with? Um, I think in some cases you tend to um, focus too much on optimization. Um, 
I think, for example, in, in, a, in, a, in, most, in most companies, building your own hosting, building your own data center space, for example, is not, most likely not worth doing, even though you can always argue it's more efficient. Um, it's just going to be too much of your mental capacity that gets wasted on something that's not a core, core feature of the company. So, in general, just um, trying to build less technology. When, you, when, you, when things are getting complicated um, for no particular reason, uh, you're going you're gonna to you're gonna regret that for a long time. So it seems very seasoned. Is there no time that you yourself play with technology just for the sake of technology? Um, no, not anymore. Well, it's, uh, I wish. <laughs> But now it's more about the organizational and processes. Impressive. I hope that's something I can learn one day. So I'm still very excited by the pure sheer like, uh, amount of technology that they're like putting in that's created lately. I'm jealous. But uh, I definitely, I definitely agree that it's most of the time, if you can solve it with less technology, it's way more efficient. And like I mean, I think this is one thing that, that we're seeing like here includes a lot of times. That everybody wants to like build this very big, impressive technology uh, instead of just trying to like solve the problem as efficient as possible. Because I mean, that's especially like when you're talking about the VC side, you're not uh, you're not uh, giving people some money to play in the playground and have their nice fancy technology toys, but you're solving uh, you're paying money really to solve a real big uh, end customer problem and uh, and address that. So I think that's where the I, I, for me, I think that, like if you have a very ambitious vision. Um, the need for sophisticated technology is going to materialize eventually, but it's prob probably not, you know, how you set up, you know, the marketing website where you accept applications for, you know, beta access. You know, that's probably, you know, if you're innovating on that, I think you're on the, on the wrong track. So it might take a couple of months or years before you get to the complicated things. Uh, I mean, this is obviously different if you're a deeply technical product company, but if you are doing classifieds online. I don't see much reason for you to innovate at all. Yeah, I totally agree with that. So what was the dream team that you personally worked on? So what was like the best people that you worked with and saying like, for those guys, if you could create a company with those guys again, I would do it again. And what was the setup? Um, I think pretty much every company I worked at, everyone was better than I was. So I'm very grateful I was you know, lucky enough to work with all of them. Um, I would say one, one, something that was just culturally set the tone for the rest of the jobs I've had was in the late 90s, in, uh, uh, late 90s or the 2000s, worked at a Swedish company called Spray. Um, it was a consulting company, but for fun we just built products on the side. Um, and it was all over the place. We had a file server with MP3 files. Um, not super legal necessarily, but we had it. And we wanted to share it internally, so we built a streaming music web service uh, for internal use that then launched publicly as well. Um, one of my colleagues had a hard time uh, you know, finding a date, so we built a gay dating website for my colleague just because we could. And it was like one of those side projects that then, like, well, it's, you know, everything was new, you could do anything. and. Uh, so like tinkering on the side produced some amazing products back then. And, uh, I think just you know, just doing things, um, not thinking so much about how, but just like if you see a problem, try to solve it. Uh, that comes with stuff. Yeah, I mean, so sometimes it's like really just going after it without knowing exactly what you're going after. Right? So I think that can help. So how did it feel the first time? And like what, one of the services, I don't know exactly which one that was that you're like the responsible for engineering hit like a million users. So how was it like? Did you like manage to scale it right the first time or like, crash and burn? Or what happened when that was like the first time that you like got to that kind of level of scale? Um, I, uh, which one was the first one? I think when I joined Tumblr it was already at massive scale, but it had some issues with you know staying online. Um, there was there was a lot of firefighting. Um, um, I, I did I did this in, in Sweden back then. It was a it was ma mandatory military service, and, and I did it minus a firefighter actually. So I think after that nothing can scare you anymore. 
No, I, I learned. I learned like one of the basic principles is, you know, as a firefighter, you don't run. You just walk fast and like trying to stay calm when everything around you is on fire. I think I, I, I'm pretty good at that. Um, and trust the people I hire. So um, you know, things are gonna fail. Everything is gonna break eventually, but it's um, uh, it's just part of it. So you seem to have like very early adopted the key principle of DevOps, which is now very popular. Lately, so it seems that you discovered that uh, yourself very early on. Yeah, I think I think it helps in in for pretty much pretty much anyone to have some software engineering skills so you can actually solve the problem through the software, not uh, manual operations all the time. So uh, yeah, definitely. Um, uh, but it's. I think I think that the skill that that's most disappearing now is the role of the network engineer in the cloud there. There's, that's basically completely gone. And um, um, things I'm excited about now is uh, like completely serverless architectures. Um, there's there's a lot there's a lot happening that so more low level so like low level but operationally focused engineers um, get sort of swallowed by the cloud. Uh, Cloud software stack and it's targeting just you know basically the software engineer and the cloud vendor you can do pretty much anything nowadays. Yeah, well, that's very very exciting. So, what what would be like your key advice for like all the entrepreneurs? Like, what kind of technologies should they focus on to build their careers around? I mean, what's like kind of the, the things that you would advise to go after if you'd be like a young engineer, either starting your career or starting your company? What would be kind of things that you say, yeah, that's the kind of thing that you need to learn now? Um, I would say don't specialize. Uh, I think spe specialization in engineering is not um, a great thing. If, I think that the full stack word has been misused a bit. Usually that just means you know, you know, you know HTML and JavaScript and maybe a, you know, a templating framework. But it's like a complete full stack understanding of everything from you know, how do you, um, how does a database engine work, what is, what is a query planner, um, knowing as many languages as you can, testing as many technologies as you can, but don't get stuck with any of one of them, it's going to make you useful in so many different ways. The best engineers I've worked with have always been completely language agnostic and uh, can, you know, utilize their skills in a number of, in so many different technologies. That's fantastic. So one thing I'd like to do is give the audience also a chance to ask a couple of questions so that like, you can also address it. So, okay. Oh. Thank you. Uh, so on the scaling topic, on the scaling topic, uh, how important is the development process? And can you give us a particular example of what has changed from the development process on a, on a high scale? Um, so, what changes in the development process as you see? Um, uh, I, honestly, I, I think most companies I work with, the development process improve and get faster, as also as we say. Uh, I think um, the, the more times, the, the smoother the, the, the development process, and especially the deployment processes are. Um, the more stable production environment you're going to have. So I think um, continuous integration, um, continuous deployments is definitely what you should always aim for. Okay, the development side of it. Um, yeah, I th most most teams I've managed have do a variation of Scrum. Um, you should not really just about all aspects of it. Um, I think the key thing is the key thing in terms of process is always having having integrated teams with product management and the engineers working very closely together, like with all the skill sets in in a team study. Um, uh, quick cycles are very clear goals that always helps. Um, also, um, at at like Google scale with twenty thousand engineers, I think this is different, but. Um, Teams are not mandated to use any specific technology, really. Use the technology that works best for their use case. Um, and then just trust you have a 
really good at the near side. Works for me. I think, I think mileage might vary on that one, but I think um, limiting engineers too much is not is not necessarily producing great results. But it's, I think it, it, it just it just assumes that you have engineers with um, someone's um, um, someone's experience and won't just be turning around to come with you because they because they can. Um, but I, I think having the teams autonomous, being responsible for both the development and deployment and then also operations of, of that product, I think a lot of organizations are going that way and I think that's the right direction to go. Hi. So, uh, what were the most common people management uh, issues that you faced when managing the technical teams? Um, the most common people management issues? Um, one common one is that uh, some engineers they uh, solve the problems themselves. They don't people manage really. They just manage the technology. Um, I think it's hard for engineers to let go of the keyboard and you know start managing people instead. Um, I think that is the most common problem. So trying to get them to. Uh, if you have a team of five engineers, you're not going to solve any technical problem yourself. You're going to have to solve it with the people you have on your team. Okay, if you have other questions, please <coughs> raise your hand. Otherwise, in the meantime, um, also another question that, uh, that uh, came to my mind is um, in terms of like the, the people management that, that, that you addressed. So what is like, I mean, what is kind of your take? Like more than American, like hire and fire stuff? Or you're more like European, giving the people a few chances? So what's like your stance, like when you're scaling the team and how do you especially deal with what I've seen oftentimes is like when the team grows up from like five to 50 people and then like somebody's a great person at like a five people team but not necessarily the greatest person at a 50 people team. So how do you deal, up, deal with those two aspects? Um, I mean, yeah, that's hard. I, I think I've fired a lot of people, and uh, it's never fun. But it's uh, it's probably mostly my fault also um, for putting them in a position they can't handle to begin with. Um, but it's, it just it just happens. I don't know how the employment laws work here, but in the US, um, it's not as easy to fire people as you might think in the US. Um, but it's um, it's. In, 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 a, in many ways, if you if you have the wrong people on the team, it's going to affect the rest of the team, and just creates a bad bad culture on, on in that group. That's going to be very hard to fix without removing the reason for it. I agree. I mean, the best engineers want to work with the best people around them, yeah. and the easiest way to get rid of a great engineer is just to make him work with a shitty one, right? Yeah. So that's like once you start deteriorating, it's like once you like put a not so good engineer next to a great engineer. Then like the culture goes all downhill, uh, like all the good people moving outside of the organization, and all the other ones who don't find that opportunity to stay. So yeah, it's also it's also some something that's complicated. Sometimes it's uh, you have engineers from different levels. Some are very senior, some are very junior. Um, sometimes you need know, also to be clear to the outside, like who is junior and who needs more support, and who is a senior and has higher expectations. Um, so I think being very clear about levels of engineers. Uh, we adopted uh, basically the Google leveling system because it was a very standardized approach, like what are the different levels of an engineer um, and especially hiring from mature organizations like Google, uh, they know exactly what they're coming into. So having like a proper leveling system on the engineering team definitely helps. I mean, that's one interesting thing I heard from a lot of people I talked with at Google that they said the problem is they have too many smart people because it means even if you're like a great engineer, you might have at the end to do very boring stuff like writing some config files because they don't really have any people who are like there for like doing this kind of boring stuff. That's true. So what is your take on like having a mix of different levels of the team? Um, I think you, you can't have too many smart people. Um, it's like, uh, Maybe Google Glass, but it's. I think I might get. I might have this wrong, but I think they only have like one guy at the top level. I think Jeff Dean is pretty much like alone at the top level still at Google. So there's still definitely room for for the Google engineers to rise in the ranks. 
So what, what is the top level at, at Google? <laughs> what is it like? Senior principal, fellow of the I don't know. <laughs> so they have like I think they have nine levels at the Google system. And uh, I don't know if you know Jeff D. Yes. Yeah, he's um, he invented like a bunch of the core technology at Google. He's widely regarded as the best program. So there's definitely I don't I don't think anyone at Google should consider themselves like too smart for the organization. In fact, there's definitely aspirational goals within that organization. Um, I, I think I think the stuff you know the stuff you build is it's going to be boring sometimes but uh, if, if if it's an interesting product uh, if you're building something exciting for society I think you're going to attract good people for the right reasons. So one final question since you're also in the in the venture side. So what is the what is needed for any of the companies in the audience here to attract your attention as a as a VC and investor? Um, Try to solve a really big problem like that. That to me is to solve a complicated problem with a great team. That makes me excited. And you have no problem with going in a market like Romania. If they're building a global product, so don't, they're not like regionally exclusive that they need to be in the UK or something. Like that. Um, we haven't gone in Romania yet. So um, until until we have, you know, I'm not gonna say there is no problem with it. But um, I'm excited being here. I'm excited seeing. I've seen a ton of great startups. I'm super impressed by the quality of everything I've seen so far. Um, I think I think there's a Romanian like you know is the glass half full? Is the glass half empty? I, sometimes I think that the Romanian attitude might be that the glass is completely empty, <laughs> uh, which I don't think you have any reason to. So I mean, for example, I had a problem at the hotel trying to hand in my laundry. I was in some kind of language communication problem with. With the reception, and they immediately started some kind of search and rescue for what they perceived to be my stolen clothes. And uh, I don't know how that happened, but they just from the get go assumed the, the worst. And I don't think you have to feel that you're in a disadvantage here. I think you are at, you have a great engineering culture, you build a great product, and um, um, just run for it, go with it, build stuff, and um, you know, make a difference. Thank you very much. Great. Program.